Hey folks, welcome back to the old Jarhead Sawdust Road Show. Here we are with the old Jarhead's Jeep dragging a big, ugly, pretty gnarly sycamore over to the mill. Look at how it just plows up the sod here. <laughs> if you wanted to plow up your yard, this is one way to do it, folks. Just run this sucker back and forth for a while and you'll be able to plant something there. There wasn't any other way to get this log over to the mill, so, you know, we hooked it up to the Jeep, put it in four low, and away we went. And it did a pretty good job. Ran into a stump or two here and there, but uh, <laughs> as you can see, we got it over to the mill. Now, this log will pose a few little challenges for Kevin as he gets it positioned and gets it up on the mill. And you're going to see him use his magic hook. That's a custom magic hook. <laughs> that he made and it's actually really nice. Sharp hook on one end, big heavy chunk of steel. He can beat with a hammer or an ax or something into the log. And so you get to kind of see that here. And I left this in because I wanted to, to show you some of what he does. Notice he put those wedge cuts, things that he'd cut off with his chainsaw, you know, hooks from the branches. And then he just kind of throws them in behind the log on either side so that when he releases the pressure on the chain, he could reposition it without the log rolling too far back. That's a guy that's done this a few times, folks. That's somebody who's been out there in the woods trying to get logs to his mill. And as he said in a previous video, he's actually done this like 30 feet dragging a log to his mill this way. So if you ever think that you can't get a log over to your sawmill, well, folks, here you go. You can see how to do it. The old uh, work smarter, not harder mentality going on here. So good job, Kevin, over at Kevin Bales Enterprises. And for those that haven't seen the earlier videos, I'll be sure to drop them down at the end of this so you can go check them out. There's a whole playlist you can go see. Let's let Kevin get this one done, and I think you're going to find some interesting stuff going on here. And by the way, you do want to stick around because something's going to happen. It's going to get a little exciting, and you're going to want to see that. So let's let Kevin get this log trimmed up and up on the deck, start milling it down. Obviously, even with the wide head, Kevin had to pull his chainsaw out and trim that butt end a little bit and then a little bit off the other end. Uh, you know, folks, that means this is a big log. And, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't really look that way, I think, when you're watching these videos. You, you don't really get the feel for maybe how big these really are. But you can see that, that only Kevin's head and shoulders are sticking out above the top of this log, and he's already cut some off the top of it. Now he's about six feet tall, so that kind of gives you an idea just how big this guy is. 
it's definitely over that 34 inch span at the butt of this log. And that's why he had to get the chainsaw out. Now, the one thing I wanted to mention about that is that that shows that Kevin is a very experienced Sawyer. You don't see that very often. In fact, I personally don't do it. Kevin has milled a lot more than I have. We've actually been milling about the same length of time, but as I mentioned in a previous video, he put 1,600 hours on this mill in two years recently. So when he went full time, boy, I'll tell you what, it takes you to a whole new level and you can see it right here. He's got the saw out, he's still milling. He did stop the head so it didn't run away from him. He bucked off a little edge right there because he knew he was gonna have some trouble getting by it and then he's right back to it. And that folks is the sign of somebody that has done this a whole heck of a lot. And one of the things I wanted to mention about the way Kevin operates is that because he's working full time at this, he has to book his jobs very, very tightly. So he doesn't have time to mess around on a job. Now, check this out. Folks, that there is a band break. I know, I know that sound. <laughs> yep, that right there is a band break. <laughs> yeah, it broke right up there on top. That's nice. Maybe. to get out of the head especially if you have to break it yourself yeah and it has a little oh. yep. jog at the end and it doesn't want to come through the cut yeah oh yeah and then you're beating and pounding and oh yeah yeah do you resharpen your own or do you use wood wood miser no i, I sharpen my own do your own yeah. it's not the white head okay yeah i, was gonna say, I thought yours was just a slight bit narrower yep it's a little narrower he's got the he's got six inch wider so yeah. get as much as you can okay <laughs> yes, folks, that's what a band break looks like. And you know what? Kevin handled that pretty smoothly, pretty cool. You know, I think when you sharpen your own bands, you know, you don't have someone else inspecting them like I have with Woodmiser. When I do the Woodmiser Resharp program, they check my bands out, they inspect them. If they see any wear cracks that are going to suggest that a band is going to break, they just replaced the band for me. You got to replace bands anyway. It's something you have to do. I do pay for that service. It costs me about 10 bucks a band when you figure in shipping, but I find it worth it. And it means I don't break bands very often. In fact, I've only actually broke one, I think, in, in 12 years of milling. And I think that's, again, because of Woodmiser. I've seen bands broken. I have broke at least one myself. And you know what? When you break one, you'll never forget that sound. <laughs> it's a bit of a shock, but um, on you go. And I've seen some pretty crazy band breaks out there, you know. Uh, one of you show me a few of them, and they're pretty crazy sometimes. Those bands will spear out the side on some mills. Fortunately, in this case, didn't happen. Now, here we go. Kevin's got to get this thing milled up. He's got some different stuff he's going to mill out of this log. And that's something I wanted to talk about, too, is, you know, there are a lot of different ways to skin the cat. We've all heard that before. And I know that there are, there are specific ways to mill certain logs if you really want to get the absolute best grade out of them. And I think that when you're milling in your own operation, maybe you've got a stationary mill and, and you're just sitting there producing a number, it's a little different because you've got a little bit more time to sit there and decide what you're going to do and how to do it. And every different species of log and type of lumber requires sort of a different approach. 
But I would argue that remote sawing is a completely different animal. You can advise your customers that a specific species should be milled in a certain way to produce the absolute best product out of it. They may want to get something out of that log that isn't something you're gonna get if you mill that way, or maybe isn't the most efficient way. In this particular case, for example, the customer wanted some beams, some six by sixes. He wanted some live edge slabs. He wanted some two by stock, all, all kind of different things. And when you're milling for a customer, one of the things that I'm always telling people is that I'm there to produce what the customer wants. I'm going to advise them uh, as to the best way to mill out a specific species for different reasons. So if, if, for example, on Sycamore, it's best done quarter sawing. However, if the customer isn't looking for quarter sawn lumber, then you know what, they're the customer. And this is a case of, you've got to decide, are you going to produce what the customer wants or are you gonna produce what you want? And yes, quarter sawing Sycamore is going to produce a better product. On the other hand, flat sawing sycamore or producing live edge is also going to produce a good product. It's going to be different. It, there's going to be movement, so you're gonna mill it thicker, but you can absolutely mill it the way Kevin is here and produce a good product out of it. Is it going to be the best, most high grade sawn lumber you can get out of the log? No, no it's not. You're going to get some good stuff out of the center. For example, if you come out of the center and you know, you're going to have some vertical grain, and if you cut the heart out of it, hey, it's gonna be great. But if the customer wants two buys, cut out of it and as many as they can possibly get in the shortest period of time they can get them, well, guess what? This is what you're gonna do. And it may not produce the highest grade, but it's going to produce what the customer wants and they're gonna call you back. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, I have customers that have called me back a dozen times. And I think that's something that's really important to understand. Yes, there are certain ways to mill certain species to get the absolute best lumber you can out of them. However, there are also certain ways to keep your customers happy, and that's very important. And, and of course, if I'm milling for somebody that's looking for the absolute best grade hardwood that I can produce for them, well, number one, I don't do a lot of hardwoods, so I'm gonna have to do a little research and I know a guy out there that really knows what he's doing when it comes to hardwoods. I'm gonna go pay attention to what he's doing and then I'm gonna mimic that as best I can because I don't do it every day like he does. I do softwoods. And when I do softwoods, I'm primarily milling for either construction lumber, which is going to be studs, rafters, joists, that kind of thing, or I'm milling for flooring and paneling or fencing, for example. And all of those require kind of a different approach. So can you flat saw for paneling, for fencing, for construction grade? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, you can, and you'll produce a lot when you do it. You do need to pay attention to stress. You do need to think about how the lumber is going to react when it dries. But it's very important to understand your production sawing. You're not there for, say, producing the, the absolute best maple for somebody to build a table out of it. You're trying to build the best you can for a customer to build a fence. And that means get her done, get her done fast, allow for face bending, reduce the crowns or eliminate crowns, knock the heart out and move on down the road. And that's what's happening here, folks. So let's let Kevin keep going. Enough of my blathering. Time for us to let Kevin get this log milled up. He's doing a fantastic job and it's awesome to watch. So let's let Kevin take it away and I'll come back to you here in a little bit and give you my final thoughts.
All right, Kevin's getting this one knocked down in style here, folks. You know, it's interesting the way he put this flitch up against one of the cants that was laying flatter and he's still milling off the other. Now, I do mill flitches against the cants a lot. I noticed that Kevin not only mills flitches against the cant, but sometimes what he does is he'll lay a flitch that's flat enough on either side to clamp to down on its flat side and then clamp against it down low and, and hold his cant in place with that before he needs to mill that flitch. And you might have seen him doing that in this or one of the previous videos. It's just an interesting technique. Kevin also uses his quarter scale, something I don't do. I've always just done the math. I mill so many different dimensions and the quarter scale doesn't cover them all that it's just something I've just gotten away from doing, but I might have to give it a try. The one thing you can do with a quarter scale that I hadn't mentioned previously, and I personally don't do, but I'm thinking I might give it a try, is that if you're actually milling in quarter dimensions, in other words, four quarters, six quarters, eight quarters, whatever, then you can just set the height that you're gonna start from on the quarter scale, and then set your simple set and away you go and it's going to get you the exact same size lumber all the way down to the bottom. So something to really give it a try. You don't even have to look at the quarter scale after that first cut and it'll take you right to the bottom. But I don't do it because I mill so many different dimensions. A lot of times I'm milling on a 16th or, a, or an 8th because I mill for what the customer wants, folks. Yeah, I might think that 8 quarters is the best way to go, but if the customer wants a board that is inch and 7 eighths, then that's what I'm going to give them. Plain and simple. That's just the way it is. Anyway, he's getting this log done. He's doing it in style. I really appreciate the fact that Kevin came out. And by the way, folks, there's still some more Kevin videos coming out. So don't worry. You're going to get to see some more of what he did. In fact, this video ends before this log is completely finished. But don't worry. In the next video, we'll finish this one off before we get to go do some maple. So you'll have to stick around for that. And while I'm at it, I thought I would mention the memberships down below. If you haven't checked them out, do me a favor. Go check out those memberships less than the price of a cup of coffee and all it does is helps the channel out and gives you some other things that you wouldn't normally get so you might want to check that out certainly the ability to watch videos earlier and some of my test videos that i put up and then i decide not to run they're longer call them the uh, director's cut <laughs> those are actually going to be shown there so a video that comes out at 16 minutes it might have been 20 minutes before it came out you'll get to see those as well as a bunch of other stuff so check that out would really help the channel out and I'd appreciate it. And do me a favor, hit that like button. Helps the channel out. I'd love it if you would, especially if you get something out of these videos. And if you're not subscribed, hey, why not hit that subscribe button and notification bell because then you get to see these videos every time they come out. How cool is that? And of course, don't forget to check out the merch down below. I really don't get much from that, but it's kind of fun. And hey, even if I make a buck and a half off of a diecast sticker or something, it helps the channel out because you know what? YouTube really don't pay a whole lot. I appreciate it though. And it helps me make these videos and bring them to you. So with that having been said, they've got this almost finished. I got another video for you right here. Check it out. Y'all have a great weekend. The old jar hit out.